Hello everyone, thanks for joining this session. So today's topic is distributed authorization for microservices powered by Kubernetes is still an open policy agent. Yes, I know it sounds like a very big topic and it indeed involves a lot of tools and, and te techniques uh, as we mentioned in the title. So I will try my best to tell a good story and hope you uh, can enjoy it. Before we start, uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Gong Meng Nan. I worked in Ninja Van before, which is a logistic com company. Uh, and now I'm a senior engineer at Shopee. Uh, Shopee is uh, one of the largest uh, e-commerce platform in Southeast Asia too. And here's today's agenda. Uh, we will start with background and goals. And then we will talk about the tools that we mentioned, Kubernetes, Istio, and OPA. Then we will talk about our solution and at last it will be a summary. Yeah, so let's start. Um, background and goals. Uh, before we start, uh, since this session is actually marked as entry level, so like regarding all the concepts uh, that we mentioned in this session, I will try to give a, a brief uh, introduction or some samples uh, for you to understand. Um, so we will start with the RBAC basics. RBAC stands for role-based access control and is very classic and popular approach for the user access control. And I'm pretty sure that you've seen in many, many other products and websites and companies. Um, even if you've never heard of it, uh, there are a few uh, concepts uh, here uh, to help you to understand. Uh, first is the user. Uh, it could be a person or automated agent, or it actually could be anything or anyone that contact your service. And then a role, which is a job function or title, which defines an authority level. Uh, and then permission is just an approval, like if you have access to a resource. Right? So it's pretty much close to uh, the real world definition. Uh, and here is a summary one-liner, a user is authorized for all those permissions assigned to any of the rules it is assigned to. Yeah, so this sentence uh, seems a bit complex, but yeah, if you didn't get it at the first time, uh, like me, then you can try to read it again. So it actually describes exactly what the RBAC is, right? And uh, to help you understand, we have a small simple here. Uh, let's assume we have user Alice and Bob, right? And Alice is a shipper and Bob is the driver. Okay, so here, uh, those two uh, terms are actually within the logistics uh, realm since uh, this was uh, the thing I did in the logistics company. Uh, so shipper, it just means who uh, have parcels to ship with us, basically the customers, right? And driver is the one who drive for us. Uh, straightforward so uh, they drive for us and deliver the parcels right and then let's assume that uh, the shipper and driver has the following permissions uh, for shipper it has uh, the permission to quit order uh, and get the order and for driver it has a permission to get a route um, and this action and resources is exactly like as the rest of all api uh, start definition, right? So uh, we we all, most of our API are exposed in the RESTful uh, style. Uh, and the good thing is in the RESTful API, the endpoints is actually representing your resource uh, and the you and the HTTP method represent the action, right? For example, for create order, it will be post uh, to this slash 1.0 slash orders endpoints. Right? So this is a perfect combo to, to represent a permission. And, and this is what we do in our company also. And, and then for the get order, you can see is get this endpoint and for get road, it will be get this uh, slash 1.0 slash roads endpoints. And combine these two, you will have, uh, you, you should be able to uh, make or, or the decision based on the user and the action they want to do. Okay, for example, for Alice, uh, if she want to post to this endpoint and it will be allowed because Alice has a role shipper and this role shipper has a permission quick order, 
which is allowed uh, to access these uh, endpoints with the post HTTP method. Right? So it's the same for Bob to get a route. And, but if Bob want to get uh, slash 1.0 slash all this, it will be denied because Bob doesn't have a role shipper, which means it doesn't have the permission create order. So it won't be allowed to access this uh, resource. So I hope it's, uh, so it's, a, it's a simple example, um, but I think it, it should be sufficient to understand what we are trying to do next. Okay, so uh, we will talk about how the authorization works before, like before we introduce our new approach. Um, and here are some typical components and maybe you've seen somewhere else uh, having the, the roughly same approach. Uh, we have a client and then there will be a load balancer before it arrives our API gateway. And the access token is valid on the, is validated on the API gateway here. So which is the first step. Um, and uh, so one note is like we will mainly talk about the authorization in this uh, session. So about the authentication, we won't really cover it. So we just uh, we just assume that you will you've already had a token, right? Um, and then for the second step, the API gateway will forward the request to the targeted service. So basically, there is a routing happening on the API gateway, and then uh, that's where the authorization happens. So it will happen on the service, which is service A here. Um, and then the service A itself doesn't really have sufficient information because it, it, will, it will get the token, but it doesn't have the user information to determine if this user has the access uh, to the specified endpoint or not, right? So the service has to make the request to another service, which is the auth service, who has all the user information to help for the authorization. Right? Uh, so this was our previous approach and probably maybe some other companies also doing the same. Uh, but there is uh, some challenges. We will talk about it later. Uh, so for this uh, approach, since all the authorization is happening on the service A, as we mentioned here, um, and here are some code snips uh, about the authorization part. Uh, so there are two approaches, the auth annotation and auth middleware, which is actually what we did for Java and Go, because that, that was our, our primary, primary languages. Uh, let's see for Java, you, we can have an auth annotation and you specify the permission that you want to allow to access this resource. For example, create order, uh, then you will annotate this uh, controller uh, function. And then for, for Golem, well, we, we don't really have something like annotation, but you can have something like the middleware. So for post the slash 1.0 slash orders, which is also create orders, uh, you can annotate this, uh, you can actually annotate these endpoints uh, with the middleware and you specify other permissions here. Okay, so this was how we do in the code, but there is some, uh, there are some challenges. Uh, firstly, the permissions required for accessing endpoints are only available in the code itself, so which are this kind of code. So it doesn't exist anywhere else uh, unless you uh, document it somewhere. And every time you make a change, you need to make a change on the documentation. Also, you need to keep these two parts in sync, which is not really uh, realistic, at least in, in, in our practices. And the second is it's very difficult for engineers to get the whole picture of the permissions required for service or endpoints. This is easy to understand because like it, it's it might scattered everywhere in your code and and either annotations or middleware. So you, you might use it in different places. And when you want to see, okay, for this microservice, what kind of the permissions it, it uses and, and for each permission, what kind of endpoints it can access. You, you can't really have this kind of information information at one place, right? You need to maybe go through a few files uh, to understand how it looks like. Okay. And the last point is, it's even more difficult for non-technical users to understand our system. So yeah, because it's not available anywhere else uh, besides the, the code itself. So for non-technical users, for example, the account managers, 
yeah, apparently they, they might they can't really understand the code, or even they can, they, they might not have access to the code. And what's worse, the account managers have to guess the permissions behind the name and often end up granting undesirable permissions, which compromises the overall system security. Uh, yeah, so these, uh, here is an example. We have uh, a user and role and permissions. Uh, so let's say for Bob, he has a, a role uh, shipper and it has a permission manager orders, but that's all we have. So all of these informations, the user roles permissions, it can be stored in the database, but after that, it only exists in our code. So for example, for the action like get, post or delete, and for, for service like what one microservice it has access to, and for the resource, like all of these, you can't really get it because it's scattered everywhere in your microservice, in your, in your code, right? Uh, yeah, so this is definitely uh, one of the difficulties for, uh, for our account managers because sometimes the rules and permissions are not even this straightforward like shipper or manage orders. It could be somehow vague and then it's hard for you to guess the real meaning behind it. Right? And uh, based on those challenges, uh, we just, uh, described uh, here is our goals. Firstly, we hope it to be language or framework agnostic, and then we hope to have a distributed authorization, so uh, there won't be a single point of failure. Instead of now, we are solely rely on the auth service. And third point is kind of related to the second point. We hope it to be scalable, and then we want it to be future proof. And yes, a bag. I'm looking at you. So a bag just replacing the R in R bag with A. So yeah, it, it means uh, attribute-based access control. So what is a A bag? So uh, for example, I want a shipper whose name is Alice with a red hair and a, a MasterCard to ship with us. Okay, uh, that's definitely a very ridiculous example, but I'm just showing you like, let's see uh, the username Alice and red hair and MasterCard, these are all a user's attributes, right? And, and like instead of the role-based access control, you can actually make a decision, decision based on the user's attributes. And this is uh, much, much more flexible than RBAC. Uh, and we've already foreseen that there might be some cases that we want to adopt this ABAC, uh, ABAC fashion. And, and we hope if we want to refactor the whole thing, we hope this uh, can actually support the ABAC in the future. Right. And the last but not least, we hope it will be user friendly because, as we mentioned, it's really not user friendly, especially for non technical users. And we hope to make the system yeah, more usable for them. Yeah. And I hope you all understand our background, like how we did the authorization before. And, and now we will talk about uh, the tools that we will utilize for the new approach. So Kubernetes is still an open policy agent. So let's start with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an open source platform for managing containerized workloads and services. And yeah, uh, period. That's all I have for Kubernetes. I'm sorry, uh, because it's not really a Kubernetes uh, 101. So I, I hope you have the, uh, the basic uh, understanding of the Kubernetes and how it works. Uh, and uh, I have to jump to the next one, which is uh, Istio. So Istio is a service mesh a solution, and uh, I might uh, spend a little bit time explaining what is a service mesh. Okay, so as the diagram shows here, uh, normally you will have clients and you might have many, many clients, then that's where the proxy layer kicks in, so it can handle some uh, logic, for example, caching, or like HTTPS offloading and so on and so forth, right? So, and then the request will arrive your service uh, in this uh, direction, as we showed here, is usually called uh, north-south traffic. And when we talk about north-south traffic, we mean the traffic from the outside to the inside of your system, right? And this part is openly, is often handled by uh, API gateway which is also the proxy layer that we show here, right? Uh, but there is also a east-west traffic as we showed here. 
and the east-west traffic, which just means uh, the the communications within your system between your services. Okay, this is the this part that we marked out, and and the service mesh is mainly targeting for this part, the east-west traffic, which are the traffic within your system. Okay. Uh, and the API gateway and service mesh, I think there's definitely some aspects are actually overlapping with each other. Uh, but when we talk about service mesh, we will focus on the east-west traffic here. And here is a uh, 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 illustration about uh, uh, the data plan. Okay, so one of the main components of the service mesh is data plan, and there is also control plan, which is uh, in charge of the configuration management and keep all the data plans in sync, uh, but we won't uh, put too much uh, weight on that. Uh, so for the data plan, and so here are uh, the main uh, reason that we introduce a data plan uh, in our system. Right? And uh, at the beginning, before we have a data plan, uh, the same functionalities are implemented repeatedly for different languages and frameworks which are this part of uh, code, the security, retries, logging, tracing, and routing, and maybe many others uh, uh, network related functionalities uh, because you, you uh, because it will be uh, reside in your code base, in your service. So you might need to implement it in Java, you then in Go, and maybe in the future, you need to do it in Node.js. Uh, so you, you need to, keep implementing it in different languages or, or frameworks. Uh, and then here is the new approach after we introduce uh, the service mesh. Uh, so here you can see we extracted uh, the code uh, to a standalone proxy. And let's see if you ran a pod, a Kubernetes pod, then you can consider these are two containers and your service will mostly care about your business logic and you will offload the networking related functionalities to the proxy. And in other words, we are outsourcing the networking functionalities to a language framework agnostic uh, proxy, also known as Saika or data plan. Okay, you, you can see like uh, in some articles or videos, they use these words uh, interchangeable, interchangeably. Um, and here is, this definitely has a lot of uh, benefits first of all is like is is a language uh, or framework and agnostic uh, right and and you can rely on the proxy uh, to handle your your incoming and outgoing network uh, traffic and this has many uh, benefits and one of it is uh, the one we are using in our uh, approach and here is a very nice drawing I want to share with you yeah, this is what a site time means okay uh, and yeah, so the external authorization in Envoy. Uh, so Envoy is the implementation uh, of the data plan in in Istio. In Istio. So Istio is actually built on top of this. So Envoy is, uh, you can consider it's a proxy itself, right? Uh, and this external authorization is actually one of the amazing uh, functionality that we rely on to build our new authorization approach. So you can see the service traffic will arrive on the Envoy first. So as we mentioned, this will is actually hijacking all of your incoming and outgoing traffic. So everything will go through this proxy first. And before it gives the request to your service, it will actually use uh, something called uh, external authorization filter to make a request uh, to OPA. And actually it doesn't have to be OPA, it could be anything. Uh, as long as you fulfill the interface of the external authorization filter that required by the envoy, right? And then your, your uh, third party service should uh, give an answer uh, like yes or no uh, to the envoy. And then the envoy will uh, forward the request to the service if it's a authorized request or it will, it will reject right away if it's not authorized. So, yeah, so this is also uh, what we do in our new approach. We actually relying on something called external authorization in Envoy. And the last piece, finally, uh, the open policy agent, uh, also 
a also uh, OPA. Uh, this is actually a very simple structure here. Uh, so when you uh, make a query to OPA, so OPA will give you a decision based on the things that you fit to it. Uh, so which is policy and data. So combining this, uh, the OPA will be able to make a decision and the decision could be any JSON value. Um, and I think that's that's mostly uh, it about the OPA and we will show you uh, how the policy looks like. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's something called Regal. So it's a policy language that uh, uh, com comes with uh, OPA itself is definitely another amazing thing that they did. Uh, here is uh, the two parts, the policy and the input, which is which is mapping to these two parts, the, the rigor policy and the data. Uh, for the policy, uh, the rigor language is actually a bit different from what uh, we are familiar with before. Uh, so, so at here, the default hello equals to force is defining a variable is hello and the default value is false, so it's a boolean. Uh, and then for this value, yeah, so this block means you will evaluate uh, these statements within the calibrisis, which are the which are some statements that it will be evaluated to determine uh, the value of hello. Okay, so uh, within uh, a block within this calibrisis, uh, it the statements. The relationship between the statements is n, so it means uh, both of these need to be true for the hello to be true. Right. So the first statement uh, it just uh, uh, declare a new variable m and it assign the value input dot message to this m, uh, and this will naturally result into a, a true. So and then it will go to the second one, which uh, will evaluate if the m equals to well, and how how do you uh, make this uh, work? So it will have an input here, and it will have a message inside, and the value is exactly world. So it means the second one will be true also. Since this uh, block is true, then the hello itself will become true. Okay, so this is a very simplified example, and it's uh, uh, the regular version of uh, hello world. Uh, and later on, we'll show a slightly more complex uh, policy. And but I think for now, uh, that's it. And finally, we will be talking about our solution. And I hope you are still with me. So, because this is actually uh, where the good stuff uh, began. Okay, so let's start with the high level design here. Uh, Actually, this uh, structure is not very different from what you see before, like what we did before. So there's still a load balancer, there's still an API gateway, and uh, in the API gateway, we'll route the traffic to the corresponding service and then pod. Okay, so this means the the community service and then the community's pod. So, uh, I I hope or I hope most of you already have the understanding of the how the community service works. So. Basically, uh, your request can arrive the Kubernetes service, and then it will actually forward it uh, to the corresponding uh, corresponding pod. It will uh, it will do a load balancing internally. So let's assume it arrives one it arrives to one of the pod, uh, and it will arrive on the envoy first because envoy already taking over the traffic. Uh, and then the second step, the envoy proxy will forward the request to OPA. Uh, via the external authorization filter. Okay, so uh, I think we, we talk about the filter a lot and the filter is just like a, a list of functions that Envoy will execute when the request come in or, or when a response goes out. Right, so uh, the external authorization, authorization is also one of the filter. Um, so when you apply this filter and it will be in the chain of the functions that it will it need to call. Right. So uh, once we apply this uh, filter, it will uh, forward the request uh, to the the, uh, the OPA that as we configure, and then the OPA will try to evaluate the request and return the result. So the result is actually just uh, yes or no. It's a simple binary question. Uh, and then the step four, uh, the envoy will forward the request if it's authorized, or uh, the envoy will reject the request on spot, 
uh, if it's not authorized, right? So it's sim as simple as that. Uh, okay, or not. Now let's uh, rewind to step three. So uh, as I said, the step three is uh, about OPA evaluate the request and return the result. But hold up, uh, I think like you are missing a very important part here is how does OPA evaluate the request? I think that's all it matters. And yeah, if you have that question, then yes, that's definitely the most important question. And we will describe it uh, later on. And this is uh, the red rectangle mark here. And uh, there is one new thing. Yes, one new uh, component, uh, yeah, which is the auth operator here. And it's actually a Kubernetes operator. And if you are wondering what is a Kubernetes operator, uh, we will have a, a small uh, sample here. Uh, the Kubernetes operator pattern is actually based on what Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes built-in uh, design. Okay, so there is something called reconciliation loop, uh, or uh, you can call it a control loop. Uh, so that's uh, actually how Kubernetes works internally. Uh, we all know that Kubernetes works in uh, a descriptive fashion. So you will describe uh, your, your needs, your requirements in a YAML file, and you submit it to the Kubernetes API server. So in this YAML file, you are just describing what you want. For example, you, you want a, a Kubernetes deployments, and you want three or five or 10 pods within it. Uh, but but you didn't really tell the communities the exact the exact step that you need to do. Instead, you're just telling it, okay, I want ten pods, and and that that's my my desire, and and that's all, right? And then communities will uh, definitely get your desire, and that will be your desired state. For example, the ten pods, right? And in this reconciliation loop, it will uh, keep observing the desired state and compare it. With the current state so it will make the adjustment to make the current state as close as possible to your desired state right so that's basically how Kubernetes works for for most of the resources that it managed and and this is also the the Kubernetes operator pattern so um the you can also use this pattern in the Kubernetes system you can implement your own operator and you need to define your own resource, which is the custom resource. And you will work in the same way. You will run a reconciliation loop in your operator and keep watching the resource that you, you just uh, define. And whenever there's a change or, or you, make, uh, you make a new custom resource, you will try to adjust the current state to meet your desire, desired state. Right? Okay, I hope you all uh, get the Kubernetes operators pattern and how does it work. And now we will uh, continue with the part that we left over, which are the part that we didn't introduce uh, from the last few slides. Uh, so here we have uh, a YAML file here. And the first step is we're gonna submit the, the CR, which is a custom resource and which is also called the service rules.yaml here to the Kubernetes. And the error here is uh, just, I just try to show uh, the, the relationships between the file and uh, the Kubernetes operator. And uh, in real life, you're actually gonna uh, upload it uh, to the Kubernetes uh, API server. And you will talk to the Kubernetes API server at any time, and you don't talk to the uh, Kubernetes operator uh, directly. And then uh, here is an example of how the uh, CR looks like uh, in the API version, the kind of metadata and spec. These are kind of the, the default uh, standard fields that you should include in your uh, custom resource uh, YAML file. And it's actually like in any Kubernetes uh, resource YAML files. Um, and here the kind is the service rule, which is we define uh, with a custom resource definition. Uh, and inside the spec, there is service and rules. Of course, it's obvious. Uh, in the rules, it's actually a, a list. It contains a list 
of items and each item has a few attributes here. Uh, it has method, uh, the path, and these two together is, uh, uh, combine these two is actually mapping to a, a RESTful style uh, operation to, to your resource. Uh, for example, here is the get uh, orders. And then for the permissions uh, is also a, a list of permissions here. It, we have get order and uh, something else. So sorry, I ran out of uh, ideas. But anyway, yeah, you should be able to get a taste of it. So this is how the service rules work like. And of course you can have as many of as rules you want. You can just keep expanding this list. Um, after you have the bundle, you, the next step is you uh, are going to upload a compiled policy to the cloud storage. And uh, this will, can be done by the OPA itself. And you can actually import the OPA as one of your dependencies. Uh, and then in your uh, own Kubernetes operator, you can, uh, you can do the bundling in the code itself. And then you can upload it to a cloud storage. And the cloud storage could be uh, AWS, uh, S3, or S3 compatible service, uh, or GCS, or, or anything else. Right? Um, and another thing is uh, the OPA bundling is actually quite powerful. And uh, there are some uh, knobs that you can tune, and you can even uh, specify uh, an optimized uh, level. And, and you, the, this will change the behavior and, and will change uh, how the bundle comes out. Um, and about, I think we won't really cover that here, but uh, do read that documentation if uh, you're interested in it. Then after you upload uh, the bundle to the cloud storage, the next step is how the OPA is going to get it uh, from it. Uh, then uh, the OPA will download the bundle uh, from the cloud storage uh, during the startup, and it's actually going to uh, periodically check the freshness of the bundle. Uh, this is also another uh, very amazing um, functionality that implemented in the OPA itself. Um, so uh, you can configure the, the cloud storage that it can download the bundle from, uh, and it will download it, and it, or it will also check it per periodically, for example, like three minutes or five minutes, um, and it will request uh, the cloud storage and uh, determine if there is any new version based on the ePEG and also some other uh, HTTP cache control headers. If, if there is a, a new version, uh, then it will download the new version of the bundle and it will uh, just reload it. So this brings another uh, advantage is that if you want to make some changes of your service rules and you can just submit it to the communities and then uh, the OPA will get the changes and it will reload by itself. Uh, during this pr procedure, you don't even need to uh, touch your deployments. You don't need to redeploy anything for, for your new rules to take effect, which is very powerful. Then the next step is OPA will get the user data combined with the policy to make the decision. Uh, here, uh, the OPA uh, itself still, again, doesn't have all the information it needs. Uh, it mainly, uh, the information it has uh, mainly con consists of two parts. Firstly is uh, what he get, uh, what it get from the envoy. Uh, when the request come in, the envoy will, will forward the request to OPA. Uh, contains a lot of um, edge request attributes. And the second part is uh, the user information it get from the auth service. And again, this can be cached, so you don't have to request to another service all the time, uh, every time, right? and it should be able to speed up your your uh, your procedure and also uh, ease the load on other services. Uh, if you still remember this uh, image that we showed before, for OPA to make a decision, you need to uh, have two things. First is the Rigo policy, which is actually converted by the YAML file, by this uh, service rules YAML file that we uploaded. Uh, and the other half is the, the data, which is get uh, from the Envoy and from the, the auth service. Okay, and then the, the step five, the last step, uh, auth operator will uh, sync uh, the service rules 
uh, which include the service name, methods, path, and permissions. Like if you still remember the YAML you just saw, uh, it will sync that to the auth service and the auth service, service will uh, persist it uh, maybe in a, in a database. And then later it can show it uh, to the account managers. And this is mainly uh, for the for the uh, displaying uh, purposes. Uh, so this is kind of the, the replica of the uh, the original uh, service rules that you submitted uh, in a YAML file. Uh, and by doing this, uh, like the auth, the auth service is also uh, can be served as a HTTP server. And by doing this, you can have a nice web UI and, and show the users and your account managers and others, uh, maybe engineers who have the needs to view uh, the rules and permissions and, and also like uh, what other permissions are capable of. Uh, are capable of. Okay. And now we will have a sneak peek of the Rico policy that uh, we defined for our RBAC uh, needs. And yeah, you can uh, click on the, you can go to the same link as me. Uh, and this is a Rico playground, another cool thing that the team did. Yeah, the team really made a lot of uh, nice uh, uh, tools. So for this uh, playground, it just uh, like other playgrounds on the left is, is the main part of your policy. And on the, on the right, there is uh, the input, the data and the output. So when we run something, the, the output will be showed here. Uh, and for the input and data, so the difference of input and data is, uh, the input is mainly the dynamic things that you receive. Uh, and the data are more like the, the information you need to support your decision and maybe it doesn't change that frequently. Uh, but for input, uh, for example, at here is actually what we receive from the Envoy proxy. So when Envoy proxy uh, making the request via the external authorization interface, uh, this is what they're gonna uh, provide uh, to the, uh, to the uh, OPA sidecar. Uh, and at here, there are a lot of attributes and I would say it's like more than enough for us to uh, make a decent decision. Uh, and here, what we care about is under these attributes, uh, there is requests and HTTP. And here are uh, like uh, almost uh, all of the HTTP uh, attributes that we need uh, to support our decision. Uh, first is the headers. It includes all the headers, even uh, the internal headers that uh, like managed by the Envoy proxy. And you can see there is an authorization header and you can see that the barrier token here. And you can also see the user agent. And, uh, and then there is also the method and path. So this, these are also used in our decision later on. Um, and now you can see the advantage of uh, having a RESTful style API because you have the method and path in these uh, attributes directly, then you can just take it and use it. And, and this, uh, the combo of the method and path can uh, like uh, map to a, a permission directly. It's very convenient. Um, and then for the data, it actually contains uh, the permission information. Uh, and here is different from uh, service by service. So let's see for this service, we have the permissions here and these permissions contains uh, two parts. And the first is uh, uh, protected endpoints and then the public endpoints. I'm not sure if it's common in your use case, but for us, there could be some endpoints that we just want to expose to the public and it doesn't require any authorization. Uh, and for this kind of public endpoints, it will just be here. Uh, and for the protected endpoints, there is another map here, which uh, the key is the permission it requires. At here is a create order. And inside this, it will be uh, the action, which is post and then the endpoints. And uh, as you can see, this can be an array and this can be an array. Uh, and you can also have multiple uh, permissions here and you can uh, just expand this list uh, when it's uh, needed. So after we see the input and data, we can take a look on the left side. Uh, here is a, a slightly uh, complex uh, Rigo uh, 
uh, policy than the hello world uh, example we saw before. Uh, and here we specify a package name and here is just importing the, the input and the data, which uh, what you, you, you guys just uh, saw here. Uh, and we have a default allow equal to false. And this allow is the one thing, the only thing that we care. So uh, in our uh, policy, so uh, the, 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 the ultimate uh, output, uh, the outcome would be this allow uh, field. And if it's true, then it means it's authorized. If it's false, then it, it means the otherwise, right? And uh, firstly, we can have a, a token. We can try to get the authorization, uh, the, the access token from the authorization header. And it also has some nice uh, utility functions like the trim prefix, which can trim the barrier of the prefix from the actual token string. Uh, and at here again, uh, the, 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 the style and the logic of the, the regal language might not be very familiar to you uh, because it's quite different from the, the pro program like, uh, programming language that we, we used to have. Uh, and, but if you use like some other uh, similar like uh, policy languages, then you might uh, get used to it. Uh, for this one, for example, for the token, here is the, the blog uh, contained in this uh, calibrisis. Uh, this just means if this thing is true, and this thing is true when this uh, is exists, right? So this just means when there is the authorization header, so it will be true. And if it's true, then we will uh, execute this function, which means we try to get the token uh, string and assign this to the token value, which means after this, if there is an authorization token, it will be assigned to this uh, token value. And it's a similar logic for, for, the, for the rest of it also. Uh, so just try to uh, get used to uh, the style of, of, of uh, thinking. And here we have two uh, allows uh, block here. And as we mentioned before, within this, within a block, like within one uh, pair of calibrisis, uh, all of these uh, statements, uh, the relationship between them is uh, end. So it means it, uh, all of the statements uh, in one block need to be true to make this uh, allow as a true value. Right? But between, the, the blocks, let's see, we have two allows here. And these, uh, the relationship between these will be all, which means uh, either the first block or the second block uh, can be true and then uh, the allow will be true. And this is um, actually very convenient for us to break down our, uh, our uh, like decision-making process instead of like all nesting it together. So right here you can see we actually split uh, the public path and the, and the protected path uh, into two blocks. Uh, and either of it is true, then it means uh, we should allow uh, this uh, operation. So for the public path, uh, we will get uh, from the permissions.public, uh, which I will show you is uh, this part, right? And after you get this part and you will try to fetch based on the method. So you, we're just trying to keep narrowing down uh, to the minimum set that we need to evaluate, right? And here we will try to get the HTTP method, uh, HTTP request method. So let's assume if it's a get, then it can get this only, uh, IT, uh, only uh, list here, uh, and it could be post lead or some other uh, methods. And Again, another new thing is this uh, underscore means it, it's a loop. So it will uh, iterate through uh, the array and it will assign a value to public path. And then it will uh, execute this uh, glob matching and see if uh, the public path actually match uh, the request path. If it's a match, then uh, it will be allowed because it's a public one. It doesn't require any authorization. And for the protected ones, it's slightly complicated. And here we define a variable s, and this, uh, and initially it should get from uh, a function. And here is an example for requesting 
the user's, for, user's permission from an auth service. And uh, here we actually make an HTTP call, uh, but currently we're not running any auth service uh, on, my, on my laptop. So uh, I just commented it out, but in the real life, you definitely can do that. You can refer to uh, this code and uh, you can make the, the URL query params and uh, you can send it out uh, as a HTTP request and get the body as a result. And at here, uh, one important thing is you can see we enable the cache and uh, I think so should you if you go with this approach because uh, you don't want to request uh, another third party service every single time when a request comes in. And so it definitely makes sense uh, for you to cache it uh, locally on the, on the OPA container itself. And, but because we don't really have an HTTP server running right now, so I'm mocking it. Uh, so I just make it uh, a, a static variable, which is a create order. Uh, and which means this S would be uh, the, the array uh, of permissions and the array only have one item, which is create order. And again, uh, you see our old friend on the score again. So this means you are doing an iteration again, uh, even though it's only, uh, it only has one item, but if you have more than one item, it will loop through. It will iter iterate uh, through uh, all the values. And uh, because this, uh, we need to evaluate the protected uh, endpoints. So at here, we are getting permissions.protected. Uh, and at here, the protected uh, only contains, uh, it also contains uh, the permission that uh, this user have, which is uh, create order, all the coincidence. So at here, uh, we will get uh, the perm, which is uh, create order. And after that uh, is another map. So we will get by the HCP request dot method. Uh, which could be get, could be post, could be anything. But, and again, you can see this whole procedure, we are just keep narrowing down to the minimum set that we need to evaluate. And this can make the process more efficient. For example, uh, if, if uh, in your permissions data, there is no this permission, or there is no this HTTP request method, uh, then it means it, it doesn't match anything. And then you can just skip the whole thing, right? It, it can speed up the, the, the whole process. And again, once you get the path, you're gonna iterate through the path again and try to match the path. So that's basically how it works. And uh, at here, we can run some example. And let's see for this example, in this input, our method is post and path is uh, slash 1.0 that rows, which is not something we have here. Right. As you see, we only have a post orders and get public orders, which we and we don't have a slash 1.0 slash rows. And if we sorry, if we click on the evaluate, and you can see uh, it actually print out like all, all the variables that we define, but uh, we only care about the allow, which is uh, a false. And for example, if we try to get to change it to get. And we will try to get this public endpoint, which is slash 1.0 slash public slash orders. And we evaluate again, and you will see it's a true. And if we make it uh, a post, and we make it to request the slash 1.0 slash orders, and you can see the permissions here uh, is create order. And we also like make a, a dummy uh, user permissions, which is matching uh, this create order. So when we evaluate it, it should show you a true also. And if we change for the permission and we change, change it to something else, and uh, then you can see that this user no longer has this permission to access this endpoint anymore. And when we evaluate, it will be false. Right? And if you, you click through the link, uh, and you can you can actually play around uh, and change something and see if it uh, act as what you expected. Okay, then let's go back uh, to the slides again after the small demo. Uh, 
Then uh, after we see the, all the policies and we roughly know how the OPA evaluate the request and how does it work with our uh, RBAC model. And the next thing is how do you enable external authorization and void filter as we talk too much about uh, this uh, external authorization. And again, this is configured by a YAML file. And this, uh, you, if you have uh, uh, is still running and you once you submit this YAML file, there will be this Envoy filter created. Uh, and at here, we have a two part that are bold. So first is the workload selector. This is definitely very useful. It means it can specify the workload that you want to enable this um, external authorization filter. For example, you, you are running some experiments and you definitely don't want to uh, enable it for all of your workloads, right? It doesn't really make sense. So most of the time you want to take it slow and step-by-step step and try to uh, rule it out slowly. And you can utilize this uh, workload selector and, and you can create, uh, create a, a uh, the external authorization filter only for one application, right? And then the next part is where uh, the configuration uh, is. And I think you definitely should refer to the documentation. And at here, we won't uh, go too deep of this. Uh, and you can see a lot of examples uh, in the Envoy, uh, in the Envoy uh, examples. And here we have a benchmark. And so here is a benchmark that we ran on our Kubernetes uh, test cluster. And we have like the, uh, we, we actually ran on GCP and we have uh, uh, H1 high mem uh, 16 or, or eight uh, machine. And it is, and we tested with 100 uh, service rules. That's like the, the rules that you saw before. We, we have 100 of them and we will see it should be a, a a reasonable number for like how many service rules that you have. Because if you have a microservice that has more than like hundreds of endpoints, then I think we would question ourselves, did we really uh, design it right? Is it still a microservice with like more than hundred endpoints? So I, I, we will see that like maybe a hundred rules or, or a few hundred rules should be a, a reasonable number in the, in the real world. Uh, applications. And we, here we have a few test cases and you can see the operations per second is actually quite impressive. And for most of the evaluation, it can be done in the microsecond level. It's not even a, a millisecond. And, uh, and I think you can definitely try to optimize your rules and make it more efficient and and trust me our like uh, policies and and the, the permissions data is actually more complicated than what you saw so i would say the performance of opa is actually very very impressive and uh, it definitely meet our needs uh and here is a summary uh, the, so by doing this, we kind of have a distributed authorization approach because the authorization now is running on the on each pod with uh, side by side together with your your service container. Uh, so it doesn't rely on a single uh, a single like auth service. Uh, and we also uh, minimize the single point of failure. But I won't see we actually eliminate it because uh, we still need to get the user information from, from somewhere from uh, which is the auth service. But since we cache it and for most of the time, uh, it doesn't have to uh, keep requesting the auth service. Uh, and then we also extract the access control out of the code uh, and we turn it into uh, the, the CR, uh, the custom resource, if you still remember, which is in the YAML file. and. Uh, furthermore, we can integrate we, we integrate it with our CI/CD pipeline, which means it can sit together with your code, and it will just be a YAML file. It's just like how you uh, do your your normal CI/CD actions that you put your maybe your deployment details uh, or your 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 GitLab uh, CI files there. So you can also put that uh, service rules YAML file YAML file 
uh, to, in your uh, in your Git repository, and then it can be processed automatically by the CI/CD pipeline. Right. And again, uh, if we need to answer this question now, uh, before uh, we after the the permissions, we don't know the action, we don't know the service, and we also don't know the resource. Uh, but now I, I would say that we answered all that question. So besides this information, the users, the roles, the permissions that stored in the database, now uh, after we submit our YAML file and it will be synced into the all service, uh, and all of this, uh, all of this uh, uh, information we can also get from our database, and we can show it in a nice web UI. For example, you can show it in a tree, and we can see like for a, a specific service. Uh, what kind of uh, permissions are needed to request this service uh, and all the, uh, the, the, the endpoint inside the service. And for a user, we can see what other permissions belongs to the user and what other permissions can do. And we, we kind of filled all the gaps in the between. Uh, and our last, thank you very much. And I think that's all I want to share today. And I hope you are still with me and I hope you uh, enjoy the content you are seeing. Thank you very much.